As you might have heard last year, Apple officially discontinued the iPod when it announced that once remaining stock of the iPod Touch, the last remaining iPod, was depleted, it would not be restocked. So naturally, the first thing I did upon hearing this news was go on Amazon and order one, because I knew they wouldn't last long, and they didn't. Now, this was an impulsive, completely irrational move on my part. I definitely don't need an iPod Touch, and as I'll soon explain, no one really does. But as someone who has a bit of an Apple and consumer electronics obsession, the death of the iPod was too momentous of an occasion to ignore. It sounds silly, but I honestly felt like the way Apple went about this discontinuation was a bit disrespectful. This is a company whose presentations and promotional videos have cinematography that outclasses a lot of films. And yet, all the poor iPod got was this three-paragraph long press release eulogy. The iPod is an immensely important device not only in Apple's history, but in all history. It's not just a hit product from a bygone era, it is directly responsible for ushering in the iPhone, which has indelibly influenced or perhaps even formed the new reality that we live in, for better and undoubtedly for worse as well. Now, there's few things I can beat Apple at, but I thought I could work up more than a paltry three paragraphs worth of thoughts about the humble iPod. And people have been asking us and wondering, when are we going to bring this technology to an iPod? Well, the answer to that question is we're going to do it today, and this is what the product looks like. So here it is, the last iPod. This is actually a 2019 model, and even back then, people were wondering why Apple would bother keeping something like this around, let alone update it. Well, I can think of two reasons. It's a very cost-effective device for business applications, such as point-of-sale, and it's also good for kids who aren't ready for an iPhone. I myself had one of them way back in the day and used it like an iPhone Lite. But looking at this thing, yeah, it's really dated, and for both of those use cases, more specialized devices and cheaper tablets probably fit the bill better. It's clearly derived from the iPhone 5 design, though it gets to be much thinner due to its lack of cellular radios, among other things. It's got a 4-inch LCD, I don't think it's even laminated to the glass, and it is microscopic by 2023 standards. It also has an honest-to-god home button. Not even a Touch ID home button, just the plain original one with a little square. I'd say it's the single element that dates the device the most, because it's not only the last Apple device to have it, it's the last one to have it by a long shot. iPad and iPhone moved on from it way back in 2014. Inside, it's got the A10, which debuted with the iPhone 7, and this generation also added a 256GB model, which had a comical MSRP. While seeing the iPod brand officially die is a bit of a sad thing, this is an extremely dated product that you would never consider, and it's really an iPod in name only anyway. The base model, which I have here, ships with a meager 32GB of storage, and sure, you can use Apple Music or Spotify, which is what literally everyone does now, but the point remains. This is not a purpose-built device for music listening. It is a cut-down iPhone, a multi-purpose touch-based computing device where audio playback is just one of its many features, one app on a grid with like 20 others, given no more priority than anything else. So by my estimation, this is not really an iPod, and by extension, it's not really the last iPod either. While its battery life, compact size, and storage capacity were all crucial in making it a successful product, the major breakthrough of the original iPod was the click-wheel-based interface. Simple, intuitive, and really efficient for navigating a music collection. At the end of the day, yes, iPod is just defined as being a portable music player, and Apple took the brand in many different directions, but much like Mac and iPhone, the interface is what made the product the revelation it was. And because of that, despite being far more music-focused than the Touch, the last two Nanos don't encapsulate what iPod was to me either. The 6th generation is like a proto-Apple Watch, and then the 7th gen, which amazingly lived until 2017, is like an iPod Touch Mini. By the way, look at that home button graphic. A circle instead of the rounded square found on all the iOS devices. Only found on this thing. Really odd, always stuck with me for some reason. Maybe it's a reference to the click wheel or a dumbed down version of the rounded square to represent the more simplistic nature of the device, which also matches the icons, which are also perfect circles, unlike the rounded squares for iOS apps. Just a crazy dedication to separating the product's operating systems. Anyway, also discontinued in 2017 was the Shuffle. While it does sort of have the click wheel, it's a headless device, so you don't get to navigate the interface with it. 
The shuffle has always been a very goofball concept to me, it seems almost Japanese. So, no disrespect to the shuffle, but I don't think it's the iPod that pops up in anyone's head when they hear iPod. Alright you picky bastard, what is it then? What's the last, real iPod? I think it's the aptly named classic, and how could it not be? It has the iconic design with the click wheel interface, ample storage on a miniature hard drive, and while it supports video playback and some rudimentary games, the primary purpose of the device is to store a big ass music library in your pocket. The one you're looking at right now is one of the last to ever be made before it was discontinued in 2014. And I'll be honest with you, I've been thinking about this device a lot, even before the news about Apple discontinuing the touch. Like a lot of other people on the planet, I use Spotify for the majority of my music listening, and while my ease of access to music has expanded infinitely from the iPod days, I feel like my grasp on it is weaker than it's ever been. I'm someone who listens to not only a lot of music, but a lot of different kinds of music, and I know exactly what I want to listen to. Spotify does not feel like it is made for people like me, and has continued to move further and further away from the iPod's concept of building a personal digital music library in the near decade that I've used it. It wasn't always like this, but saving an album puts it into this amorphous blob of albums that quickly gets out of control. Meanwhile, the Artist tab no longer reflects saved songs or albums. Instead, you have to manually follow each artist, and clicking on them takes you to their splash page, which is automatically sorted by popularity, instead of a list of things you saved. That's another click. For a traditional music listener that plays albums front to back and doesn't just want to hear what came out in the past month, it is incredibly frustrating, and I find myself neglecting tons of music that I probably would be listening to if it was easier to visualize and navigate. Clearly, my idea of a music listening experience is just not the model anymore. The new model is prioritizing podcasts, ads, official playlists, and recommendations that often have nothing to do with my listening habits, and even trying to serve me news on international armed conflicts when I just want to listen to Pusha T. This is an insane amount of noise and bloat for an objective as simple as listening to music, and it makes me yearn for the days when activities and individual subjects were quarantined to their own worlds, instead of everything in reality collapsing in on itself in real time. Listen, I'm not a boomer, the advantages of modern music streaming and tech in general are quite obvious, but with each passing year it becomes more and more clear to me that new tech is not necessarily a linear progression. I look at something like Spotify and how it's almost regressing music listening and creation. Strategically bloated albums, fake artists, and an overall shift of consumption toward this endless playback algorithmic abomination where even the shuffle button is contrived. At this point, I feel like this streaming era has more in common with 20th century radio than it does the iPod's concept of personal curation. The same can and has been said about something like TV and movie streaming, which increasingly resembles cable. I'd say the two things we are desperately lacking right now with our devices and platforms are boundaries and control. So equal parts fed up and inspired, I decided it was time to do something. It was time to bring the iPod back, just to feel something even if it's a temporary novelty. You may or may not be aware, but there is a rich, vibrant fan base for classic iPods, and all sorts of third-party modifications on offer that breathe new life into these relics. I spent a few hours of my life deep diving into that world and was super impressed by the breadth of what I saw. Integrated Bluetooth, Qi wireless charging, and one guy even put the Taptic engine inside. Stupidly cool stuff, definitely check some of those out. What I'm going to be doing here is far more basic, but should be enough to make the iPod usable in 2023. So step one was choosing an iPod. Unfortunately, nanos are virtually impossible to work on, and I didn't want to go with something as old as the Mini, so that left the bog-standard iPod. You might have expected me to go with the classic that I showed earlier, but that thing is mint, so I didn't want to mess with it, and that final classic design doesn't lend itself well to modification anyway, due to its aluminum front panel and excessive use of clips making it difficult to open without damaging. I decided to instead opt for a fifth generation, officially known as iPod Video, which seemed far easier to work with based on other YouTube videos, and as an added bonus, I never had one back in the day. Now, the most sought-after revision of the 5th gen is this so-called 5.5 or enhanced model, which is distinguished by its search function and superior audio quality thanks to a different DAC chip. 
I just went for a 30 gigabyte fifth gen because that was the cheapest and I don't really care about those features. As for where to source these, I got mine on eBay, but you might have some luck as well as save a few dollars by taking a trip to your local thrift store. The next thing to do was plot out my parts list, much like a PC build, which is very funny to me. Everything except the SD cards were sourced from Elite Obsolete Electronics, whose name came up quite frequently in the research period for this project. There's no sponsorship or affiliation here, I just went that route because it was more cost-effective and convenient than buying piecemeal from random eBay sellers. But depending on how many parts you want, that route might make more sense. I got a new front, back, click wheel, and select button. Basically everything that you touch, which is a big deal to me as a clean freak. I assume there's a factory or two in Shenzhen still producing all these new parts, which is pretty cool. The two major non-original parts are the battery and storage solution. I mentioned SD cards, and those are for this crazy, absolutely hilarious looking micro SD card array that runs 4 in parallel. For the battery, we've got a 2800mAh pack. There's a 3000 that does fit, but it was out of stock at the time I ordered. Going for the far bigger and more modern battery will of course improve battery life substantially, but going from a mechanical drive to solid state will also have a big impact. And to top it all off, check this out. Apple still sells 30-pin cables and 3.5mm earpods. Now, an iPod of this vintage would not have shipped with earpods. They were actually introduced with the iPhone 5. It would have shipped with either these or the design before that. I'm not sure which. Both of those are super uncomfortable though, so I went with the earpods. Since this is my first time doing this and there are dozens of videos from far more experienced people, I'm not going to tackle this like a full-on tutorial, and I'll instead just cover the general process and some of the frustrations that cropped up. Step 1 was obviously getting inside. I used this pry tool that you see a lot of people using, and this is one of those things that once you understand it, it's really easy to do, but I did spend a minute or two kind of perplexed and damaged the front casing, which isn't an issue since I'm replacing it, but just something to be aware of if you did care. Once inside, two ribbon cables bind the front and back shells, one for the battery and one for the hold switch and headphone port. Super easy to get both of these out, and I moved on to the hard drive, just another latched ribbon cable, hit it with some tweezers, and it came out no problem. I think we do need to take a moment to appreciate this hard drive, though. Much like the capacitive multi-touch display was on the original iPhone, I would say the miniature hard drive was one of the component-level innovations that enabled the original iPod to be, at the time, the super compact and storage-dense device that it was. Seeing it today just seems so quaint and distant. It's kind of crazy to consider that less than a decade after this 5th gen came out, Flash became ubiquitous enough to completely displace hard drives in this type of use case. After removing the hard drive, I was able to unscrew the plastic front plate from the frame that houses the motherboard, and after that carefully removed the display. Now the motherboard itself was a bit of a pain to remove from the frame due to the adhesive joining the two. And there was also this metallic sticker, I'm not sure what its purpose is, if it's using the frame as ground, but I went ahead and left that alone while I removed the click wheel. I was kind of surprised how simple this thing was to deal with given that it's such a compact and relatively modern device. I did have some frustrations though, and it was mostly to do with my replacement components. The back panel has a few screw posts for the hold switch, headphone jack, and 30-pin port, and I had an insane time trying to get those screws to go in. I thought it was a me problem, but I quickly realized that compared to the original back, the distances of the screw posts were just completely off. Whoever is making these doesn't have amazing tolerances. Some I was able to force in, but two of them wouldn't go in at all. It just wasn't physically possible, so I gave up and ordered a new back that already had everything installed. On the front, things went far more smoothly. I remounted and routed the ribbon cable for the replacement click wheel and secured the board, frame, and display to the replacement front housing. Then, the fun part. Opening all the micro SD cards and inserting them into this hilarious array. After that, it was simply a matter of positioning the new battery and connecting all the ribbon cables. Yeah. 
After assembling my iPod and confirming its operation, very important that you do that before sealing things back up, I was confronted by two things that I kind of hated from the iPod era, iTunes and the syncing process. If you want to put music on the iPod, you have to manage your library through iTunes, and I also quickly remembered that FLAC is not supported. Pretty much all of my locally stored music is FLAC, and I briefly flirted with the idea of installing Rockbox, a homebrew iPod OS that supports FLAC, but I couldn't do it. No offense, but it just looks ugly. It sorts things like a file directory, and I feel it negates the entire purpose of this iPod experiment. The original OS is so gorgeous, and that's kind of the entire reason why I wanted to use an iPod again, so I instead embraced the stock iPod's limitations as a challenge. As dated as iTunes is, specifically on Windows, I have to commend Apple that this still works at all. From what I understand, support is still maintained going all the way back to the original iPod. That is serious dedication to backwards compatibility, and guess what? It completely recognizes my modded iPod with no issues, even properly displaying its newfound 256GB capacity. Since most of my music is in FLAC, I had to really think about what I wanted to put on this iPod, and I came up with the idea of biasing towards period-accurate music. I spent some time browsing Rate Your Music's top-rated albums from 2003 to 6. This was a ton of fun, and added another dimension to the whole experience. I picked some that were already favorites, some that I hadn't listened to in a while, and even some stuff that was entirely new to me. The music selection process takes on much more weight here than it does compared to saving an album on Spotify, because once you leave the comfort of your PC, that's what you're stuck with. So after loading up my retrofitted iPod with a sufficient amount of music, I went out into the field with it for a whole week to see how it would hold up as my primary music listening device in 2023. First off, some comments on the mods. This thing is super fast and light due to the removal of the spinning hard drive. I can vividly remember my old iPods taking a second or two to seek on that mini hard drive, and it doesn't happen here. It's totally instantaneous. It also has comical battery life. It might be broken, but I seriously could not make a dent in the battery indicator, even after a week. The only annoyance that came from my tinkering had to do with the scroll wheel. It could be a loose connection or another dicey third-party component, but every once in a while, the scroll input kind of freaks out and gets jumpy. It's annoying, but was infrequent enough that I managed to work around it. As for using the iPod in 2023, well, kind of surprising. The actual interface, the OS and click wheel, has not aged at all. It's an excellent interface, and I was not viewing it with rose-tinted glasses. This is legitimately an easier way to manage music listening than Spotify on an iPhone, with some major caveats. Obviously, there is not a robust search function, and playlist creation is not worth it, at least on the go. But for an album listener, this is near perfection. It's fast, easy, simple, and does not require super precise inputs. I can't remember the last time I listened to music by album or artist when I was going about my day, just walking down the street, because on Spotify, doing that requires a lot of digging and more precise input. That ease of use is especially advantageous in a car, where I could genuinely make a case for this thing, especially on a longer highway road trip for album listening. Now, I'm not advocating that you iPod and drive, but compared to CarPlay, my god, this is way easier, way less stressful, and way less distracting. If it wasn't something recently played, I don't even bother trying to dig through Spotify on CarPlay, but with this, you're in and out just using one thumb to do a simple, predictable input. The biggest flaw of the iPod, what makes it feel dated even in this heavily modernized form, is that it is not a self-sufficient device. Meaning, if you want new music, the iPod can't do anything for you. You must go back home to your computer, add music to your iTunes library, and then sync the iPod. This is going to come off as a cope, but I found that it added more weight to what I did have on my iPod, and an attempt at a somewhat period-accurate library made it feel like a time warp. But ultimately, this week with the iPod confirmed what I pretty much already knew. The use of modern music streaming platforms has significantly changed our listening habits. 
Whether that's a positive or a negative depends on who you ask, but for me, the experience with this iPod made me want to invest more time into maintaining my local music library, which for me is housed on a personal server, to at least attempt to claw back some ownership of my digital music experience. As someone who is super conscious about their music listening, even I've become occasionally roped into the ease and comfort of listening to the same playlists, and being fed the same few songs on autoplay because that's what the streaming platforms are set up for. I'll be honest though, I don't really see myself continuing to use this iPod other than for occasional novelty factor or maybe in the car, but I'm certainly glad I did it. The iPod modding itself was a super fun project, though it did have its minor frustrations. If you like to tinker with tech like I do, I can definitely recommend it as it's extremely accessible and modernizing old tech is just cool. Spending time with the iPod in real life was awesome too. Using a dedicated device is really refreshing, it puts things into perspective, and it's nice to get away from this modern notion that everything has to be and do everything, even if just temporarily. You ever wonder what this pocket's for? <laughs> I've always wondered that. Well, now we know, because this is the new iPod Now. I think I can safely say that I've now respected the iPod. The aspects of the iPod that date it, both positive and negative, are quite obvious. But its simplicity in achieving the goal of music listening is not dated at all, and I think we need to see some of that back, as I explained earlier. While dedicated devices are now history to the average consumer in the era of multi-tool phones, the idea of making something that simply achieves its function in a solid and permanent manner should be the goal of designing any tool, whether it's a dedicated device like the iPod or a streaming platform. But solving a problem and then leaving it alone just seems to be completely incompatible with modern living. In regards to Apple's disrespect of this legendary product, I'm completely aware that they're doing just fine without capitalizing on the iPod brand, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't. In the first few versions of iOS, there was no music app. It was simply called iPod, a fitting tribute for the device it would ultimately kill. Now, I would never expect Apple to give Apple Music some kind of iPod retro UI treatment now, but they really should make an iPod retro of sorts, like what Nintendo did with the NES and SNES Mini. It could literally just be a mere vessel for Apple Music with its own unique interface and a haptics base click wheel, and it would instantly become a huge hit, or even a must-have fashion accessory like the AirPods Max have become. Anyway, I think I've said enough about the iPod in this super self-indulgent video. Thanks for watching, and while I hate to ask, likes, subscriptions, and checking out some of my other videos would be greatly appreciated.